I'm Patrick Sang, global citizen, investor. Join me as I talk with global influencers for their insight, wisdom, and how they overcame their own personal challenges. Sharing positivity, overcoming challenges, creating one world together. I'm Patrick Sang, anything is possible. Welcome to another episode of Anything is Possible. We have an important guest, uh, Senator Bob Worsley. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, nice to meet you. Bob, so um, you're a senator. Tell us your mission, what's your organization do, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I served in the Senate in Arizona since 2012 and retired last year. Uh, I'm now pursuing a new startup, seeing some of the things that we need desperately in the United States. Um, I'm working on workforce housing and a new product that will be built in the factory like a car uh, that will be hou a housing product. It's called zenihome.com. So tell us a little bit about zenihome. We take uh, two 20-foot containers and two 40-foot containers, marry them together. We call it a jewelry box because it's very, very nicely done, cladded, beautiful uh, treatment, windows, doors. And then on the inside, we use robotic furniture from MIT that was just commercialized last year and uh, create rooms on demand. So you might have uh, your living room becomes your master bedroom at night. Uh, 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 then it becomes an office the next day, the same space. So your air conditioning and cooling uh, and heating one space and it becomes three different rooms. Um, so we have uh, three big robotic pieces in each home. One's a pocket closet that opens for your, for your get ready in the day and then it closes so that eight feet is now available to you for other uses during the day. And then a, the other one is a studio unit which creates the dining room into a bedroom and office depending on what you want to do. So it's uh, everything has solar, uh, has um, lithium ion batteries, inverters, so it can be on or off grid. The uh, sewer is black and gray water split, so that you can process that if you want to off grid as well. Um, it's got the latest technology we can make atmospheric water for potable water out of the atmosphere, the, the humidity in the air, an invention that came out of ASU a couple of years ago. So we're trying to put all the technology into a smaller space that can transform to what you need so we can actually live in less square feet. Excellent. So I really appreciate the fact that you are, you know, you had a long career in politics and in government and um, you retired but you still kept on going. Um, what's the sort of motivation behind um, not stopping and you know just uh, taking some time off? Well when I was 35 I started SkyMall, the in-flight shopping catalog that we used to look at on the planes and uh, then I built a, a power business that makes renewable energy that stopped forest fires so they go in and thin the forest and use that material for making electricity for 28,000 households in Arizona so I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a futurist entrepreneur, all those businesses were very successful. We've done well financially and I felt like I had one more in me after the political service and seeing that our government doesn't get everything done that needs to be done and the private sector needs to invent and innovate and come up with real solutions. And so I'm looking at this as a way to solve homelessness, workforce housing. There's a huge gap right now with housing appreciating during COVID rapidly in the West at least. Um, and now a, a new a first time home buyer has to pay 400,000 minimum for a house. And that's just keeping a lot of people in rental situations where they should uh, be able to start building equity in a home. So we're hitting that market strong. It's very impressive and very inspiring because um, I believe that entrepreneurs are the guys that change the world. We need people that innovate have the crazy ideas and actually get up every morning try to repeat after each mistake each setback and eventually overcoming and succeeding right and um, every, every business I've started has had to be redone and tweaked several times sure. to be successful and, and I think you know from your perspective is that the fact that you've also gone into government it gives you a great insight into um, 
both private and public sectors, and that gives you like a much broader way of looking at things, right? Yes, I, I found of my 90 cohorts that I served with, 30 in the Senate, 60 in the House in Arizona, um, the level of expertise and intellect is quite low. These are people that are very ambitious but maybe haven't really been successful in life. And so I think a lot of the bright Elon Musks of the world, they, they live in, a, in this uh, capitalistic, entrepreneurial environment that I think changes the world. Uh, government will not change the world. Government keeps things moving, keeps roads working and garbage picked up. Um, but entrepreneurs change the world. And sometimes even governments hinder yes. The progress. Yes. The bureaucracy in the United States, at least in the building sector, is incredible. Um, before I left office, we passed a prop tech bill, like a fintech bill, um, and we have a sandbox in Arizona. We're the only company in it um, where you're taking new innovative ways to do real estate. and. It gives you a two-year um, regulatory-free environment to play in the sandbox. And we're enjoying that, but not very many states have a safe place for a startup company to go in a highly regulated field like building codes, fire codes, and let's innovate and rethink house, how a house works. Sure. Um, so I'm really grateful we got something done in government that gives us the ability to play in a sandbox for a couple of years. Understand, that's great. Um, in terms of, um, let's change subjects a little bit, success. How would you define success and how would you go about achieving it? Well, I'm, my, um, my story is one of, I have lots of ideas, but when I lock in on a good one, I just do it. I was on an airplane when I was 35 years old September 1989, and I came up with the name and the concept of SkyMall on an Alaska flight from Seattle to Phoenix. By the time I got home, it was on a napkin. The name SkyMall was written down. One year later, I was on all airlines for 25 years. <laughs> and we went from nothing to $150 million business. Um, that was done in one year. Call center set up, warehouses set up, printing, literally train cars of paper uh, to make all the magazines necessary for the airlines and contracts with all of the airlines. So amazing things can be done by entrepreneurs in very short periods of time, even if it looks extremely complex. Like how do I get all the airlines to put my catalog in the seat pocket of every plane for 500 million employments a year? So it's possible um, and I think entrepreneurs are the, are the epitome of taking a vision and executing it. Ben, Being thank successful. you for that. That's, that's an amazing, inspiring story because that completely demonstrates, epitomizes anything is possible. Anything. Right? Napkin, you know, on the plane. That's uh, amazing. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, give, not giving up, is there an example that you can give to us whereby you wanted to give up very close to, you didn't, and you persevered, and you succeeded? Well, I'll take the first, the first time I got hit in the face uh, was 1994. We started the business in 90. Uh, the idea was 89. In 90, we're in business, but we, the idea originally was to have a catalog of catalogs as a mall in the sky. You would use the air phone for a free call and then the product would be waiting at the airport. Oh. Very complex. We had robotics, picking, uh, picking uh, merchandise. And Maybe a bit ahead running of your time, perhaps? Ahead of my yeah, time. Yeah. Robin Leach thought it was the best idea yeah. ever, did a big art, yeah. did a big show about it. It was great to be interviewed by him. And so it was very sexy, yeah. but it was a very bad business model. Um, so, in, in September of 1994, we had lost $13 million that year trying to expand into more airports. Okay. And my investors called up, my two investors, and said, we love you, we love the idea, but we don't want to put any more money in the business. We haven't gone public yet, 
So my two lead investors that had put up $25 million said, we're done. We don't want to put more into it. And so I was faced with my two almost best friends. And they said, look, we, we think you did a great job. You can lock the doors, close the business. We don't need to do a bankruptcy, nothing like that. But we're just done. And we're OK if you stop. I had no money. I was just a young 35-year-old kid, now 30, 39. And I went through a catharsis of, do I stop? And having those people that trusted me and put money in it was very difficult. But I went home and said, no, no, we're not going to stop. We flipped the model um, and said all of the companies in our catalog already have warehouses. People are complaining about schlepping more stuff home from the airport. Why don't we deliver it to their home or to their office directly from the catalog company, like Dropship, and we won't have to have inventory. And then the cash model went to what we call a, a negative from a negative cash flow to a positive cash flow because we charge the credit card when they place the order we we let the merchandise get shipped from the other catalog company they want us to be paid they want to be paid in 30 days so we're actually generating cash as we grow faster than having to buy merchandise and having negative working capital we went from losing 13 million dollars a year to making 2 million profit the next year we went public, and then we sold to Rupert Murdoch in 2001, um, 52 days before 9-11. Our planes, 14 of the 19 terrorists that crashed the planes had been shopping from us, and we had been selling them and shipping them merchandise. We gave the FBI, FBI a dossier of credit cards, addresses, where these people had been taking test flights and buying SkyMall to just stay busy so they didn't look suspicious to the passengers around them. And all of that happened because I didn't quit. There was a chance to quit. Everybody said, you have our permission to quit. You've done a great job, but this is just too expensive for us. And then those guys who thought they were writing off their investment made a huge profit when we sold to Rupert Murdoch and when we went public before that. So I. Those guys think I walk on water today, both of them. We told you, Bob, to close the business. You wouldn't do it. You found a way with no money to flip the model so that it was generating cash instead of using cash. And the company was very successful. Love the story. It's an amazing story. You should um, make a movie about it. <laughs> it, was, it was a fun business. Yeah. Um, what's your life ethos? Um, I believe that... Um, we are consuming too much of Mother Earth. And we need to learn how to be renewable. We, we own all Teslas. We will never own an internal combustion engine car again. Um, we are trying to start this business where we downsize in, we've lived in six, seven, eight, 20,000 square foot homes. And we're just consuming in the United States, we consume nine Earths per capita mm. of copper, you know, aluminum, steel, and, and all of lumber, etc. We can't con we can't continue to do that. So, in 1950, we lived in 940 square feet with five people in a home. Today, we live in 3,500 square feet with three people. Something's gone really wrong since 1950. So we're trying to open up the idea of you can live in smaller, it'll give you a lot more money to spend on vacations and other family enjoyable things, and less money on mortgage payments, big yards. And so how do we get back to living on, using less of Mother Earth? And uh, that's a passion I have. Also to save the forests in the West. Um, we built a biomass plant after I sold SkyMall. We built an $80 million biomass plant. We feed 28,000 families power that's green. We go into the forest and the Forest Service gives us a prescription. We take all the trees and thin them to their prescription. 
take all the material, grind it up, and we burn it in the boiler to make electricity. So I've been doing this now um, since 2005, uh, and I believe that if we really turn our attention to it, you can make money and also move toward a world where we're not using, so, we're not consuming so much. Uh, and so that's why this last startup, Zenny Home, is to get people comfortable living in less space. Use robotics and technology and live well in a smaller space. Less is more. Less is more. Um, I'd like to make a, a, a comment on what you just said. It's like, you know, for our investment, um, a lot of people tend to misunderstand or have a misconception thinking that impact investment or sustainability has to be mutually exclusive with profit making. No. So uh, I just want to reaffirm that, you know, it's very um, inspiring to hear that, you know, you're one of the also allies that know that, you know, we can still invest into sustainable, good quality, purposeful projects that can not only save the planet, do meaningful things, but on top of that, as entrepreneurs, we want to make money, but we can do it along the way. One thing I'd like to add to that is to have fun along the way. Absolutely. You know? Yes, we our biomass plant is, I, I joke with my family, but it's like an ATM. It, it spits out $3 million a year. And we just got extensions from the utilities until 2033. So this will be 25, 30 years of our life that the business is... It's operating every day, 98% of the year, um, all day and night, and it's just making a profit. Cash comes in from the utilities on the 21st of the month, APS and SRP pay half and half for the power. It makes money. We have 50 people employed. We pay union wages. Um, and so everybody likes working there. They have great jobs. They're very safe. And we make money. And it's a good thing for the environment. To win, 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 win. The watershed, the air quality, everything wins. So on Anything is Possible, our mission is to share positivity, to overcome challenges, and to create one world together where we try to eliminate uh, prejudice. We want to um, encourage diversity and inclusivity. Um, what is your number one advice that you would share with the younger audience, especially young entrepreneurs and business leaders? Well, I'm also passionate about immigration and multiculturalism, and um, I wrote a book this last year called The Horseshoe Virus, and it talks about how the state of Arizona was deeply racist, and for that reason I joined the Senate and I took out the Senate president who was passing all the bills that were trying to get rid of Hispanic immigrants. Um, and, and so I tell my, my, young, my kids, I have six children, and 31 grandchildren. Wow. We've been married 43 years, my wife and I. And I am so proud of my children and my grandchildren because the level of racism is dramatically reduced in the new generation. I don't know what happened, if it was television or school education, but the level of, I have a daughter that's a redhead, a beautiful redhead, and her husband, really great guy, they were there in Salt Lake City with Black Lives Matter, with the black community, you know, last summer. Good for that. And standing proud in front of the crowds, cars honking, some people flipping the bird. <laughs> and they were standing there saying, this is wrong. And that generation is so exciting because they are embracing diversity. They do know that regardless of your race, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, your intelligence and your ability to contribute is equal or better than one that would be embracing racism and these crazy theories of the past, eugenics, and theories that the blacks were not as smart as white people and um, you know all these crazy things that we believed in the 19th century, the 20th century. And so I'm really excited for this new generation to uh, embrace uh, the beautiful, and I think America is great because we are multicultural. When you go to China or Japan, it, it's homogeneous pretty much. And so getting a country like America to work where you finally look past the color of someone's skin, 
their sexual orientation and you see them as a human being with tremendous things to add, insight, creativity, and, and uh, productivity, innovation, it's all there. It's beautiful. Um, Bob, we don't have enough time now, but it was an absolute pleasure. I got a lot to learn from you and I think um, I need to have a long chat with you on, on China and your trips there. Love to. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.